Hola, mi nombre es Neftalí Rivera. Estamos en el Miller Sylvania uh, State Park. E entonces vamos a estar haciendo música uh, de Puerto Rico específicamente hoy. Vamos a estar hablando de la plena, de la bomba y de otros ritmos que han influenciado la música que nosotros hacemos hoy en día, eh, como la salsa y otros ritmos. Eh, la base de, este, de estos ritmos pues, son los ritmos originales como la plena, la bomba y aguinaldo que ustedes van a escuchar aquí hoy. Y para más información les dejo con Ramón Cancel. So, hi, I'm Ramón Cancel and I've, I've been playing together with the Boricuas for the last 10 years. And we're here in Washington, uh, the state of Washington, at uh, Miller Sylvania Park. And this is part of the Roots in the Park uh, program. And we're going to be playing some music uh, that is native to Puerto Rico, uh, like bomba and plena. And uh, those rhythms are kind of the roots uh, for a lot of the music that we listen to today, like salsa and some uh, reggaeton and other rhythms that, that come from the African influences in Puerto Rico. We're very glad to be here with you. Well, this is Grupo Boricuas. We do music from Puerto Rico, from Cuba, and from other uh, Latin American countries. Uh, the first songs we're going to do is a song that I wrote for Puerto Rico a few years ago. By coincidence, half the, the name of the song is Puerto Rico. What a coincidence, right? <laughs> okay, so here we go. And Ramon is going to play the Puerto Rican Cuatro, which is uh, our national instrument. And Martin Vélez is going to be doing the percussion. Martin is, uh, Martin is a legend here in, in the Northwest, in the music, Latin music. So here we go. <laughs>
y alegre el coquillo no cambia por ninguna la tierra donde nací la tierra de mi amor Puerto Rico la tierra de mi amor Puerto Rico Okay, I start to play music uh, since I have memory, basically, since I was a kid. And all my family was the influence that I have. Uh, when I was a kid, um, for example, somebody visit and ask, uh, are you gonna play the guitar or something? And you say no. It was strange for them. They, Why not? No, I don't know how to play guitar, but how is possible, you know, uh, because Basically, everybody in the family play music, some instrument. Most of us play guitar because it was the instrument that was more available to us. And everybody, uh, for example, I can borrow a guitar from somebody in my family and play, and then that's the way we do it. When we get together, we make turns to grab the instruments available because everybody's going to be playing at a certain moment. Uh, then uh, my father was the first influence in the music. He bought me a guitar. Uh, I remember we spent $10 on this guitar in our town. And I started to uh, learn how to play. I teach or taught myself uh, guitar. And he did that because he knew that I was never going to be a good farmer like he was. <laughs> so he told me, you will never going to be a good farmer. I'm going to buy you a guitar, so you play guitar for us. Said, OK, let's do that. And I did that, and I have a better life than the rest of the family who <laughs> have to work in the fields. <laughs> I was smarter. <laughs> OK, anyway, and that's the way I start to learn uh, the music, and especially uh, our music is uh, our treasure, and that's why I play uh, especially music from Puerto Rico, and we play also music from Cuba because it's really, really similar. Um, most of the music that we play in Puerto Rico uh, have some influence uh, from Africa, and especially from the big island, which is Cuba. That's why we play basically Cuban and Puerto Rico. Uh. I started off uh, as a young guitar player, couldn't play the guitar, didn't have the fingers for it. Um, my mother was a piano player and we always sang at home and we sang at church too. And so I, I sang since I was a little kid. Uh, when I was a teenager, about 16 years old, uh, being born and raised in Los Angeles, we used to go to a park called Griffith Park and that's where all quote unquote rumberos would go to and we'd have jam sessions, everybody playing drums, and of course there were different levels. The beginners would be at one spot, intermediate guys here, and the professional guys over here. So you tried to find your own group and eventually graduated up to the next one. And Maybe somebody took you under their wing and showed you things, but uh, mostly Puerto Rican and, and Afro-Cuban music, uh, playing rumba, rumba guaguanco, playing bembe, playing bomba, playing plena, and then, of course, salsa, because that was the popular dance music, and uh, everybody wanted to dance. So I, uh, I studied pretty much on my own, listening to records a lot. My, my parents had tons of records. And then uh, when I went on to school, I met some other guys that played as well. And uh, we started playing together and, and studying. You know, it took a lot of study. took a lot of time doing that. Um, then I moved to Portland is when I started actually playing professionally with, with orchestras, with Latin orchestras playing salsa and mambo dance music and uh, I've been doing that since oh, 1975 and uh, still play in the besides this group I play in a few other groups as well and it's kept me real busy. So I was born uh, fairly recently in, in Puerto Rico <laughs> uh, and uh, it's interesting uh, because Puerto Rico um, is a U.S. territory or became a U.S. territory in 1898 so it's been quite a while 
And even though it's a different country and you feel the different culture and architecture and all that, um, there's a big influence uh, uh, of uh, the American culture as well and, and even, uh, you know, generally in, in English, right? So um, I actually grew up listening to rock music. And uh, particularly the Beatles were a big, big influence. And I used to watch the Beatles cartoons with my sister. <laughs> And we used to put a recorder in front of the TV, and that's how we, you know, built our catalog of Beatles uh, songs. But uh, I first grabbed a guitar at age seven and uh, started learning, learning a lot of the Beatles songs and, and all that stuff. Um, but I, I first recorded professionally uh, at age 15. I did take lessons, um, primarily uh, classical, uh, for both uh, guitar and also singing. And uh, I taught a little bit of guitar as well during my teen years. Uh, and interestingly, I, I moved to Portland uh, 20 years ago, uh, r roughly, and I had never played any music in Spanish or barely played any music in Spanish until you know, I, I came here. And that's when you start kind of missing you know, a lot of your, your roots, really. And thanks to Neftali, he actually uh, encouraged me to grab the cuatro so I learned the cuatro uh, here in Portland, never played it in Puerto Rico, even though I was uh, close to it uh, often, but uh, never really ended up uh, grabbing it. So, um, and I've been playing cuatro, I guess, for the last uh, about uh, maybe six or 10 years. Uh, but, um, and then singing in Spanish also was new to me. I would always sing in English in, in Puerto Rico. So that, that's kind of my story. Puerto Rico, uh, during the years, we have a really uh, beautiful relationship uh, with uh, Cuba, especially the, the artists uh, and the musicians. Some of the most beautiful songs that have been written for Puerto Rico have been written for uh, composers like Pablo Minanes, for example, and also Guillermo Portavales, which was one of the first uh, Cuban uh, composers. Uh, they call it cantautor, that they write their music and they also perform or sing their music. They have been uh, 
doing songs from Puerto Rico, really, really beautiful. And between Cubans and Puerto Ricans, we are like brothers. For example, when you go somewhere and you met somebody from Cuba, it's basically the same that you know somebody from Puerto Rico because you know that you're going to get along really good, really well, because our culture, our music, we are loud. Some of them drink rum, not us. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, not anymore. That was in the past. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we basically like parties. We are always uh, playing music and having a good time. And I believe that's why we get along so good. And a lot of music, when I was growing up, my dad used to play music in Puerto Rico. And I grew up thinking that that was Puerto Rican music. And then I found that it was not, it was Cuban music. But that's why the relationship between them and us and their music and our music is so, so nice, you know, that we get along. And especially the music is a really nice thing that we have that get us together more, especially the music, because we both uh, love to do music. And the music is so similar. And actually, the Puerto Rican cuadro, uh, according to the history, uh, people think that was uh, like a cross between the guitar and the Cuban tres. The Cuban tres have six strings. The Puerto Rican Cuatro these days have uh, 10 strings. At the beginning, have only four, but then they had more strings. By uh, 1940, already have 10 strings, the, the Puerto Rican Cuatro. And the Cuban Tres have six strings, but sounds really, really similar also. And we play basically the same patterns in the Cuatro that we play in the Tres to play salsa and other kind of music. Yeah, I was thinking, uh, so one interesting aspect uh, when we talk about collaboration with other countries nearby Puerto Rico and, and not just Cuba, but also Dominican Republic and even Venezuela and certainly Mexico and, and other Spanish-speaking countries. But one thing that's very interesting, and a lot of people don't know this, uh, when, uh, when you ask people where did salsa come from, uh, if you ask Cubans, they'll say they invented it. If, we, if you ask Puerto Ricans, we'll say, we invented it. In reality, it was a blend of different rhythms and styles that includes jazz music. So it's a blend of uh, Afro-Cuban rhythms with Puerto Rican rhythms, Cuban rhythms, and jazz. And that's really how, how salsa was born. So it's really, um, uh, often it's really hard to pinpoint exactly where a rhythm comes from. Uh, it usually comes from a blend of different cultures and backgrounds. Okay, the next song is a plena. Plena is a rhythm from Puerto Rico that started to become really popular in the early 1920s. And that rhythm was brought to Puerto Rico by the Africans who came to the island to work in the sugar plantations. Uh, and they brought their instruments, their culture, uh, their music, and that music uh, still remain in the island, and it's very important for all Puerto Ricans and um, people who uh, like our culture. <laughs> uh, at the beginning, that music was uh, basically used like a newspaper, and with that music, they shared the struggles and the things that they had done during the day, the work day, and. They were allowed to do that kind of music on Saturday nights only, okay? And they go in the middle of the sugarcane plantations and they play their music with uh, drums and some other percussion instrument that they brought from Africa. And that's the way the music starts, okay? And this song is from one of the composers in Puerto Rico. His name is Andres Jimenez. And it's uh, the name of the... The song is La Mirada. Ajá. Tan solo una mirada 
plena. Okay, now we're going to talk about the plena, uh, which is uh, one of the most popular rhythms in our island. Uh, plena came from Africa a long time ago, and it became really popular after the 1920s. Before that, it was just music that only the black community plays. But after 1920, it started uh, start to become popular between uh, everybody in Puerto Rico because of the rhythm is so happy. And people use this rhythm to express their feelings, their struggles that they have during the day. It was more like a newspaper. And everything that happened in the community during the day, during the night, they get together in street corner and they use their uh, percussion instruments and they talk about whatever had happened during the day. For example, one of the most popular songs is Coltaron Elena. Uh, that's happened that in a fight, a woman from the neighborhood, uh, somebody caught her with a knife. Um, because of that, they wrote that plena, Coltaron Elena, Coltaron Elena. Coltaron Elena y se la llevaron para el hospital. Uh, you know, simple things that they happen during the day. There was another story about uh, when we have the train in Puerto Rico. There used to be a train long time ago. They call it La Máquina, the machine. And La Máquina, Martin, can you give me a, a bomba rhythm here really quick to explain? Uh, it's originally it's a bomba, which is another of the rhythm like that. For example, that's another story. And they continue like that uh, until these days, there's still neighborhoods, especially in Loiza, Puerto Rico, which uh, they have the really strong uh, roots, black uh, roots, uh, it's a black root uh, community. And then they still play this kind of music like they used to play it before, okay? And going back to the plena, I want to show you, because these are the drums that uh, is called panderos. And these are the drums that they uh, use at the beginning to play plena. And after that, they start to incorporate the cuatro, for example, the Puerto Rican cuatro guitars, maracas, bongos, and other instruments. But at the beginning, it was just played with uh, these panderos, and maybe a guiro, which is this instrument. Ramon, can you play this a little bit here? So, so you can hear the sound. Is basically okay. That is called the guido, and with the guido, the other instrument, percussion instruments, uh, they play the the plena. We're gonna do a small presentation how the patterns for the plena goes with the uh, panderos, and I'm gonna start, and they're gonna follow me here. The problem with that is to sing at the same time that you're playing. It's very difficult. So most of the time, there's a person who plays the guiro, uh, which is a, a, the pattern is constant, and then it's the person who sings. And the same with the bomba. Usually, the person who sings is the person who plays the maraca, because it's easier to sing and play something like this. But when you are playing, for example, at this speed, and sing at the same time is very difficult. That's why, okay? But that's basically how the plena was played uh, back in the day in Puerto Rico. And they still, uh, in Puerto Rico, they still use these, uh, uh, they're called panderos or panderetas. And that's the way uh, there's uh, groups now that basically they play the plena 
with uh, the congas. Instead of the panderos, they use the congas because have a deeper sound and they can get more volume out of the congas, okay? So that's basically it, the, the, the story of how the plena came to Puerto Rico a long time ago, and it came from Africa. And there was, in, uh, actually, there was a governor, uh, Spanish governor at the beginning that he prohibits to play this kind of music because they said, no, that's music that only the black people can play, you know, and the high society, those days in Puerto Rico, they play more uh, Spanish music like waltz and polkas, you know, music more sophisticated with pianos, uh, violins, and other instruments. And this kind of music was considered just for basically poor people, <laughs> okay? If you play this kind of music, you were not considered too elegant on those days, you know, okay? Here, the, these days is different, but that's basically the story. Um, for me, it's a great pleasure to play this kind of music because it's our music, and this represents our culture, our people, and our history. My name is Natalie Rivera, and our group is Grupo Boricuas. And with us tonight, we have uh, Ramon Cancel, and we have Martin Vélez. Uh, Martin, for example, has been playing music with me since the beginning of times, <laughs> maybe 25 years or so. And then Ramon has like 10 years playing uh, music with us, with Grupo Boricuas. Thank you very much. Mamá no quiere que yo vaya a la verdegué. 
in Puerto Rico, we have what we call the Puerto Rican Cuatro Masters, but most of them have passed already because they were old. There's still one that is the only one from the old masters that is alive, and he's from my hometown, Morovis. His name is Illuminado Davila. He has 102 years old, and he still play and do shows, okay, 102 years old. He's one of the, actually he's the last of the great masters. But after that, there's a bunch of young musicians that have emerged. For example, we have like Edwin Colon Sayas, bunch of other musicians, uh, Christian Nieves, which is uh, playing with uh, Ricky Martin and other persons. And there's a bunch of the young Cuatro players that actually have take the cuatro to another levels because they combine the music, they mix our um, folkloric music like Aguinaldos and that kind of music with more modern music and they have developed another level of uh, musician who play the Puerto Rican cuatro but it's something a, really, a little different than the original way everybody played the cuatro in Puerto Rico. But there's plenty of young people doing the cuatro in Puerto Rico, which is uh, something that uh, we, everybody likes, especially all the Puerto Ricans, the, the new generation. So Puerto Rico is only 100 miles by 35. Yeah. And it's only roughly 3 million people living in the island. Nowadays they say there's more Puerto Ricans living outside of Puerto Rico than in Puerto Rico. But uh, we always call ourselves Puerto Ricans, even though you know, like uh, there's second and third generations of Puerto Ricans living in the U.S. But uh, we're still very proud of the fact that there's many artists that are known uh, yes. worldwide that came from this very little island in the middle of the Caribbean. And you know, so Naftali mentioned uh, Ricky Martin, but there, there's many, and it's not just in music; it's also in theater and, and cinema and, yes. and literature. Yeah. So big influence from such a tiny Small place. Island. Yeah, the cuatros in Puerto Rico. There's several ways to make the cuatro. The original way they make a cuatro, uh, they grab a big piece of wood and they carve the box, which is the, the box of the instrument, and then they put on top. They put the the lid. Usually, is made out another kind of wood. Uh, for example. Okay, uh, the original Cuatro in Puerto Rico, this part, all this part, was made out of one piece, including the arm. All this was one part. They only put the top, and this called the diapason. That was the only wood that they put. Uh, it was basically three pieces. They call it one piece because the box, the body of the Cuatro, is in one piece. But then, after... So, passing, you know, the time passing by, they discover that if they make the cuatro different kind of woods, uh, for example, because in a, a big chunk of wood could be parts that are not as good as other, or maybe the acoustic is different. Nowadays, what they are doing is, for example, this is an example of the, this is one piece, but what they are doing now is they put the back is, could be from the same piece of wood, but not like before, they, they have to carve. And the, if there was a piece, bad piece of wood here, stay there. Now they select the best pieces of wood and put them together and glue them like they do with the guitar, okay? This is only one piece also. Uh, they made this uh, from uh, for Ramon, they are in Puerto Rico. Uh, this has like a year with you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a year. And this is a great instrument. It's beautiful and was made for, his name is uh, Rodriguez. Julio Rodriguez? Mm -hmm. Julio Rodriguez in Puerto Rico. And there's so many others. And in order for, have to, for you to have an instrument like this, it had to be made in Puerto Rico because there's Cuatro ladies made in Japan, Taiwan, and they look beautiful, but the sound is not the same because of the woods. Um, this, uh, this wood on top is abeto, right? From Germany, abeto alemán, and this other wood is uh, palisandri or palo santo, 
which is one of the most expensive and the best wood to make an instrument. That's why these cuatro have such a beautiful sound. I'm not a cuatro player. Ramon is the one who played the cuatro. <laughs> so in Puerto Rico, there's people who have been dedicated all their life, and the only thing they do is Puerto Rican cuatros. And they are experts, they use the best wood. And when you buy an instrument made by somebody in Puerto Rico, you can be sure that it's a pretty good instrument. There's also cuatros made in Paracho, Mexico. And they build pretty good guitars in Mexico, but the cuatros that I've tried, at least, <laughs> you know, it's different. It's a different story. My dad used to say, zapatero a tu zapato, which means, you know, you have to make what you know of. You cannot make everything. Thank you. 